Good evening. I'm Jeff Badnock, and on behalf of the University of Montana Alumni Association and the Community Lecture Series Committee, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Community Lecture Series. This series, now in its 25th year, showcases some of the outstanding faculty here at the university and the work they do in advancing research and learning. We'll begin with the university's statement of acknowledgement. The University of Montana acknowledges that we are in the aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. Now that we are back to a live in-person lecture format, we are trying something new with respect to ticketing. Rather than list a price for a ticket, we invite you who are enjoying these lectures to pay what you think it is worth to you. We have suggested $30 for the whole series or $10 for individual lectures, but we hope you will determine yourself the value. It is a risk, we know, but we are confident you can figure out for yourselves what you are gaining in learning and enjoyment. And as always, if you know of someone who would enjoy these lectures here with us or over Zoom conference, please feel free to spread the word. If you haven't already registered, please do so through the University Alumni Association webpage. These lectures are being video recorded by our friends at MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, for later cable cast and posting to YouTube. Later during our Q&A, we will be handing around microphones to capture questions from the audience for those watching over the internet and for the later cable casts. Those of you who are watching over Zoom, please post your questions in the chat function. We have someone who's monitoring that and will be able to relay your questions and comments to the speaker. And now please take a moment to silence your personal devices. The seal of the University of Montana features a hand holding high a torch and bears the university's motto, Lux et Veritas, light and truth. Our university is a place where students come to study, learn, and conduct research in an effort to pursue light and truth for themselves and for others. The university's efforts at supercharging this research component was recognized this past year when it was awarded R1 designation as one of the nation's top research institutions. It would be daunting to provide you with a lecture series that touched on all the areas in which the University of Montana faculty are doing research that earned this award, but we are happy to present a series where you can gain some appreciation for the world-class research going on across the campus. The committee has selected Dr. Monica Serban as our second lecturer in this year's series. Dr. Serban's academic background includes a PhD in medicinal chemistry. If you are looking for an example to answer the question, why research, she would be your answer. She spends a great deal of her time in her lab at the university researching ways to enhance healing and working on the structures of life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Serban as she presents her lecture, Harnessing the Power of Knowledge. Thank you so much, um, Jeff, for the very kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank you for choosing to spend the evening here with me tonight. I'm glad that the weather cooperated, unlike last week. And, um, First of all, I would like to thank the committee for inviting me and allowing me to be part of the series. I am honored by the invitation, and I'm humbled to have the opportunity to showcase some of my research, especially in the context of the amazing work happening here at UM. So I would like to share um, today with you my vision for harnessing the power of knowledge. And I structured my lecture in three different portions. I would like to start with showcasing three of our projects happening now in our research uh, group. Then I would like to talk a little bit about biotech. And I think I have to thank Tim Nichols, uh, who last week hope, hopefully ignited your curiosity about what biotech is. And last but not least, I would like to conclude with uh, some of our our outreach that we have done over the years, and obviously, I look forward to our Q&A session. So starting with research, um, overall, 
the, the central theme of the research in our lab is focused on medical devices. We're not specifically married to any one field for medical devices, just overarching medical devices. And I think what kind of gives us a unique spin on our approach is the fact that we are thinking product early. What does that mean? So for instance, if I am interested in working on a new medical device, I'm asking early the question, why would I want to work on this medical device? Is there a need for it? Is there a market for it? If I make it, would someone buy it or use it? Then obviously, if the answer to those questions is yes, the next question is, OK, I want to make a device. What's the best way I can make the device? What are the best materials I can choose to make that device? Would these materials be safe? Would the device be effective? And most importantly, can I have something that's cost, cost efficient? And also, from a regulatory perspective, can I use something that's already known to the Food and Drug Administration that would make the regulatory process for my device faster and easier? The other question is, yes, you can make something wonderful in a lab setting, but can you manufacture it? And so obviously, you know, as scientists, we get excited about being creative and making something that's impactful, but also we need to look at the practicality of making a new device. Is it scalable? Um, again, going back to cost efficiency, if I can make it in four steps, I should make it in four steps and not use 10 steps to produce that device. Also, how do you package it? How do you sterilize it? How do you store it? Can you make it so that it's cold chain independent and you don't need to store it at minus 80. Rather, you can store it on your shelf in the room. Then the most important question in my mind is, who are we making this device for? And I think this answer is kind of intuitive. We're making a medical device, right? We're making it for the patient. Well, if you think product development, that's not always the right answer. Because at the end of the day, it's the medical staff, the nurses and the doctors who interact first with your product. And if it's complicated for them to use, if they require additional training to be able to use your product, that's not a very attractive product. So this actually resonates personally with me because the first company I worked for was a very how should I say, it was a great opportunity for someone coming out from a PhD, right? It was focused on tissue engineering, making organs. How cool is that? It sounds spectacular, right? And obviously, I was excited about that. And so one of their products was this neourinary conduit that was targeting cancer patients, so bladder cancer patients. So normally what happens when someone has bladder cancer, obviously, unfortunately, the bladder needs to be removed to remove the cancer. But now the surgeons have to find a way to, co to connect the kidneys to the outside of the body to eliminate the urine, right? And so what typically happens, they cut a piece of the patient's intestine and turn it into this conduit that now would create a connection between the kidneys and the outside of the body. Well, my company at that time, um, the name of it was Tangion, decided to tissue engineer this neourinary conduit and eliminate that step of cutting the patient's intestine in addition to removing their bladder, right? And so the concept was to have this scaffold made of a biomaterial. And the scaffold obviously would be cylindrical. They would take a small biopsy, fat biopsy from the patient isolate cells, expand them, put those cells onto this biomaterial tubule, and engineer a neourinary conduit. This sounds spectacular, right? Well, this is what their product was. The product was kind of this big. This was the bioreactor. And it looks beautiful, but when the surgeons got it and received it, they were like, um, what exactly am I supposed to do with this? Okay. And so what happened there, they had so much variability from surgeon to surgeon and from patient to patient because it was so complicated to use the product that um, it failed in phase three clinical trials. So that means a lot of money that was spent at that time and the company went bankrupt. So 
that's why it's important to ask the question early on. Can someone use what I'm making? Is it simple enough? And that goes hand in hand with another principle that I'm trying to follow in my research. Always try to reverse innovate. So what does that mean? Typically, when we think about innovation, for instance, think Tesla. What are we thinking? It's fancy, complicated. I need to figure out how to use it, right? So more learning for me, more bells and whistles, more expenses to make it. But that's not always relevant for everyone, and not everybody can use something that's complicated. So we're trying to create innovative solutions to different problems, to existing problems, by simplifying things and making our devices and our products simple to use. So one example is this one. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the typical baby isolates that we see in all of our hospitals. They are used for preemies to regulate their body temperatures because the babies cannot do that. So what do we see here? It looks pretty, right? It looks fancy. Uh, we see that it requires electricity. We see that it's complicated enough that probably neither one of us could just walk in and use it, right? We would have to be trained. Um, I can tell you that isolates are typically over 20,000 a piece. And it's a pretty big, chunky piece of equipment, right? So we are used to this, and we take this for granted and all these resources, but that's not true for all settings. So people in remote areas, in different parts of the world, uh, people who are moving a lot would not benefit from an isolate like this. And so an example of reverse innovation comes from a company named Embrace, which uh, simplified this complicated gadget to something like this. So it's simply a baby swaddle, and it has a little pocket in the back where you would insert a waxy material block. That waxy material uh, melts when it reaches body temperature, and it keeps that temperature for eight hours. So anyone who has any kind of stove or heat source can warm up that block, put it in the baby swaddle, and make sure that they keep the baby uh, the baby's body temperature at the right uh, temperature for hours without something this fancy. So this is what we're trying to do with our project, trying to come up with innovative solutions, but without making it very complicated, especially for the users to use. And so now with all that built up momentum, I'll tell you actually about our project. So the first one is focused on developing a single application treatment for outer ear infections. The second one I'm going to touch on is uh, focused on bioengineering, a skin reconstruction device. And the third one is focused on engineering a hearing loss prevention system. So let's start with the first one. And this goes back to the title of, I guess, the seminar series. Where do we get our ideas from? Where do we find the knowledge or the ideas or the questions that we're trying to answer. This uh, project was inspired by George, who's my dog. And we adopted George almost eight years ago when we moved to, my family and I moved to Montana at this point. And George started having a lot of ear infections, okay? So like a good pet mom, I took him to the vet. I was given the little bottle of droplet um, ear drops. And I was told, make sure every day for 10 days, twice a day, count five drops in his ear, make sure he keeps it there, and George is going to be fine. So this is kind of the procedure, right? I don't know how many of you have dogs and had to go through this. But I mean, it looks nice and easy pictures. It's not that easy practically, right? Because once you carefully count your drops, this is what the dog does. And that's what George did. Now, at that time, this is kind of how life in my household looked, OK? I had two small kids. I have twin daughters. And trying to get everyone out in the morning to go to school and work was crazy enough without worrying about the dog and his eardrops, OK? So for my own selfish interest, I asked the vet, do you have something that you can just put in his ear now, and I can go home and not worry about it? And she said, no, unfortunately, there's nothing like that. And so I figured, well, why don't I make something like that? So this is how we ended up working on this project, right? 
And so obviously the first thing was understanding what am I trying to solve? Yes, it's an ear infection, but what, what are the details? And oddly enough, I found out that in dogs, their ear canal is L-shaped. So in humans, it's just a um, straight line, right? A horizontal line. In dogs, it uh, is, is, is L-shaped. So that kind of complicated things, and it kind of made sense why people were using ear drops, right? Because it's a liquid. You put it in here, and it nicely flows to where the site of infection is. Well, if you were to put in um, an ointment, probably it would be stuck here, right, and never make it to the infection site. If you were to put in a gel, it would have the same fate. So we figured out that the best solution is to come up with a material that can be applied as liquid, but that gels once it's in place. And we have this system, and I'm going to use a fancy science word now. It's called a thixotropic system. It means it's a gel at rest, but when you push it through a nozzle, like a nozzle of a syringe, for instance, it liquefies because of the shear stress. So to put it in easy terms, things catch up. Think catch up. Catch up is the same, right? So you have to shake it, and then you can squirt it out easily. So it's kind of the same material here, and not catch up, obviously. Um, and then once we developed this material and we saw that it performs nicely, you can see that I can squirt it out through a very thin hypodermic needle. And I got creative here with the UM initials. And you can see that it gels in place rapidly so it doesn't uh, flow. Uh, well, first thing when you make a new material, you have to figure out if it's well tolerated by the tissues, right, where you want to put it. So our ear canal is coated by skin. And we used 3D skin constructs. You can buy this. You can actually buy little skin pieces in tissue cultures. And we used those to make sure that our products are safe, the, the material that we synthesize. So this is just a negative control. And that means if your bar is up here, it means that your material is good and the cells like it. This is what a uh, bad material looks. It kills all your cells, and you don't have a signal. And then you can see these were two gel formulations that we were testing, and both of them were nicely tolerated. This here, uh, the dotted line, represents the, the acceptance criteria that comes with this standardized test. So anything above the dotted line is considered to be safe. So our, with our materials being safe, we then wanted to know if they actually are able to incorporate an antibiotic. And if after putting in the antibiotic in our material, we can still kill the bacterial strains that cause the infection in the dog ear. And so we saw that if we use ciprofloxacin, it does kill the bacteria. So our gels did not have a bad effect on antibiotics. And then moreover, we showed that if you were to put our material in a dog's ear, so these were done in mice, not in dogs, uh, we have a temporary uh, threshold shift. So it's kind of like um, you have a little bit of hearing impairing, hear impairment, but it's similar to having eardrops in your ear, right? And we saw that after 10 days, that's, um, that was gone. That effect was gone and reverted to normal. So basically, using our material, would have the same effect on your hearing as using eardrops. Now, this is kind of like the condensed version of all the data we generated. And I don't want to bombard you with science, but I'm a scientist, so I have to show you some data. Um, this uh, project was very well received. It made the cover of this journal called American Chemical Society Biomaterial Science and Engineering. They actually selected the paper for an immediate press release. And uh, fortunately for us, it was interesting enough that even Reuters Health covered it. So um, kind of a little bit of a success story here. We're still working on it for further um, safety and efficacy data. And we're hoping that we will be able to move it into the commercial space so that finally our dogs and people can ben benefit from it. Now, moving on to the second project, this is uh, focused on bioengineering skin reconstruction device. So as I told you before, um, at the beginning, I'm not just focused on one area. The previous uh, project was on hearing. This is on skin reconstruction. So again, first question, why do I want to uh, work on this? 
right? So the question is, there's no rapid response product for skin wound management. If someone has a burn or a big skin defect, what happens? They have to go to a hospital, and the next course of treatment is to get a graft. Usually, it's coming from a different body part of the patient. And that graft is then used for skin reconstruction. Now, you can imagine that for soldiers in combat area, it takes a long time till they get from the battlefield to tertiary care centers where uh, they can receive skin grafts. And that compromises the, the wound quality and also the, the outcome, the actual outcomes of the reconstructive procedure. Similarly to general first responders, there's nothing out there that any first responder could use to rapidly address these defects. And you know my favorite topic, the veterinary world, there's nothing out there for animals. And if you remember, I think it was 2019, 2020, when uh, there was that huge wildfire in Australia where over 3 million um, animals got badly burned and there was nothing there to, to treat them. So obviously there is a critical need where we can come up with some innovative solution for that. So how do we approach this problem? We figured that we want something that's kind of the same thickness as the skin. We want it to look and feel skin-like. We want it to be regenerative. That means that it actually is going to encourage the tissue around it or the tissue it's on to regenerate and repair. We want it to be bio-integrating. That means that I don't want to have a device that I put it on and then I have to remove it surgically. I want something that goes away as the tissue heals. And I wanted something that's self-adherent so that no sutures or stable, staples would be needed to keep it in place. And also therapeutic. What does that mean? Well, typically if you have a big wound, obviously you need to uh, manage pain and infection, right? So how is that done typically is by oral or intravenous administration of opioids and antibiotics. And we wanted to create a device that would allow, for instance, for the doctor to put an ointment or a solution on top of our device that would seep into the tissue and stop the pain and infection right where it is without the need for administering uh, drugs systemically. So this is how our prototype looks. And you can see um, it's really nice because it takes the color of the patient's skin. Um, so um, we expect great cosmetic outcomes. It is self-adherent. Again, this is a little bit too sciencey, but trust me, it's very sticky. It's sticky to the same point as other commercially used, used tissue sealants currently. Um, it has micro needles. And when I say micro needles, think about the thinnest syringe needle that you can imagine, which is the hypodermic needle. This is 160 times smaller than that. So it's really tiny. And that means that it doesn't hurt when you apply it either. And the structure of the material was intentionally designed to be porous. You can see these channels here. That means that when you put the drug on top, it has a way to seep in the wound. And then we showed here that if you just have this backing by itself, this is how much drug goes through. If you have this micro needles, it enhances uh, drug permeation, and if you have this backing, the micro needles, and it's sticky, meaning you have a nice contact between the device and the tissue, you have a higher drug amount that you get into the tissue, which is great. Last but not least, again, we used our favorite skin in a dish test here. We created a little wound here. This is a biopsy punch. And you can see here what happens at 20 days when you don't have a device. So the tissue starts healing, but it's scarring. Whereas if we put our device here, you can see that the tissue, the, the top layer called the keratinocyte layer, starts closing in. And then here we have fibroblasts that constitute the underlining dermal layer migrating in. And you probably you can see that better here in these fluorescent images. So it looks like our device is doing exactly what we were hoping to do. And we're very excited to continue characterizing this further. Last but not least, uh, this is our current biggest project in, uh, in my group. 
we are sort of in the middle of it right now. Uh, it's focused on engineering a hearing loss prevention system. It is funded by the Office of Naval Research, and it targets the development of a noise level enabled drug dosing and delivery system to prevent hearing loss. So we would want to have a system that would release protective agents to preserve hearing only in response to loud noises. We don't want something that constantly medicates someone, but only provides medication on demand, right? And so this might sound easily that, in a, that it actually is. So normally, when you're looking to develop a drug, you synthesize a compound. Obviously, there's logic to that. And then you just take cells and you test your drugs in those cells to see if they work. Well, in the field of hearing research, there are no cells that we can just go and buy commercially, like for other applications. And there's an added complication. Again, if we're trying to find a way to, uh, to, to get drugs into the cochlea, which is the snail-like structure, this is where the hearing sensory cells are and hearing loss occurs. If you administer drugs systemically by mouth, the amount that makes it here is very, 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 very tiny to the point where it's not effective therapeutically, okay? So our approach is to try to figure out a way to get drugs in topically, right? But then look at all these barriers that I have to overcome here. We have the eardrum, right? So I need to make sure that I can get drugs somehow across the eardrum. Then I have this big hollow space, which is the middle ear. Then I have this tiny window here, which is called the round window membrane. And this is my port of entry to those cells that I want to protect. So a lot of challenges and not a lot of tools for us to develop our drugs and test them. So the first um, challenge here was to kind of build some testing systems that would allow me to rapidly screen whatever compounds I synthesize and have a quick read. Is it going through the tympanic membrane and the round window membrane or not? Is it helping the cells or not? The second uh, step here, and this is where we are right now in the project, we are actually synthesizing these compounds that we are hoping to, provi uh, to prov uh, provide hearing protection. And then um, third, last but not least, is we're trying to develop smart drug delivery systems that would be attached to the tympanic membrane, sort of like a little band-aid. So imagine a mini band-aid that would go on your eardrum uh, and would not impair the normal function of your eardrum and then would open to release drugs in response to loud noises. So I'll just show you what we achieved in the first year. Again, remember, we have to find a way to overcome these two barriers and figure out if I make a drug, is it able to naturally just go across the tympanic membrane and the round window membrane? And so we synthesized uh, an eardrum in a dish and round window membrane in a dish, and we validated them against human tissues, and we found that they have the same permeation properties. We also 3D printed this special device where we basically sandwich our tissue, and then we're able to put a drug on top and then figure out how much goes to the bottom. So kind of trying to figure out what would happen in a normal ear. And this is kind of how the tissues are presented, and this is the little tissue um, insert that goes in these devices. Now, not only that this um, achievement addresses the needs of our project, but also it offers a um, significant novel tool for the research, uh, for the hearing research community for drug testing. They can do now high throughput screening of multiple uh, drugs. Uh, we're hoping to eliminate or minimize at least um, the use of animals for hearing research. Everybody's using mice and chinchillas because that's what is available, but everybody understands that those models are not really relevant to what's happening in humans. And we are hoping that down the line, the FDA would use our systems as an acceptable testing systems for drugs to move into the commercial space. So with this slide, I'm concluding the portion about our own research Hopefully, I didn't overwhelm you with all the details. And I want to talk a little bit about biotech. 
So I became the director of biotech last January, so not too long ago. And basically, I see biotech as a way to share knowledge. We all heard the saying, knowledge is power. But then someone said that knowledge shared is power multiplied. And that's what we are trying to do with biotech. So the focus of the center is to um, offer unique educational and research opportunities. And it is focused on biomedical technology innovation, specifically therapeutics and medical devices. So kind of building on my own research for um, intended primarily for resource limited areas. So we're tar targeting again products for military in combat areas, people in rural areas, and uh, people in developing countries that do not have access to all the technology that we're used to in, in developed uh, parts of the world. So our mission is to try to identify biomedical product innovation opportunities. And you'll see in a little bit some of our ways we do that. Then we seek to develop and characterize product prototypes for various applications. Um, the center will guide the prototyping and product development process to the point where it's ready for technology transfer readiness, meaning there's enough data to support the feasibility of the product, and then to interest a company to license the technology from the university and take it into the commercial space. And so the idea is to have this center to create a technology portfolio where we can shop around our intellectual property and patents to companies interested and kind of help move out our discoveries, the academic discoveries, into the commercial space and to the people that need it. So who do we have in biotech so far? I am uh, very privileged to be working with uh, Heidi Box, who brings to uh, the team tremendous grant management expertise and business strategy savviness. Um, we have a small group so far of very talented faculty that are very um, innovation minded and um, looking to push the boundaries and create new um, inventive solutions. And we have so far uh, two um, researchers that help with our work. Uh, the idea would be to have a lab space, um, and that's what we're building right now, where uh, typically what you see in, in the university is that each uh, investigator has their own lab space where their people are. We want to build this collaborative lab space where everybody's um, team can work together and uh, brainstorm and come up with ideas and, and have this cross-pollination of ideas and expertise. Uh, in terms of our immediate goals is we are now in the process of building a new core facility and this is our very fancy 3D printer. It looks small, but it's kind of the size of a big refrigerator. And what it can do, and this is just for that aha moment, if you look at this pencil, that's the tip of a sharpened pencil, and these images just zoom in. And then you can see that this printer can create this kind of structure at this very, very tiny scale on <laughs> the tip of a sharpened pen. OK, this is nice for illustration purposes, but what does it do for us? So remember the micro needles that I showed you for the skin regenerative device? Those were done with such a printer. So the sky is the limit with, uh, for what you can do with such a printer, and not just for biomedical application, but generally for semiconductors, photonics, and all kinds of application. So we're hoping that this um, instrument will bring a new set of technological capabilities to UM and kind of enable us to, to boost the, the research capabilities regionally, not just locally. And um, obviously, we're all about collaborations. We already have a collaboration established with Dr. Rob Miner for, uh, from the Billings Clinic Heart and Vascular. Um, that's part of the Community Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Miner is a, um, an interventional cardiologist, so he um, fixes people with clogged blood vessels, to put it in easy terms. 
And sometimes he encounters very complex cases where surgeries don't go as easy as they should just because the patient's uh, vasculature is very tortuous and um, not easily accessible. So what we're trying to be able to offer to him and his colleagues with this printer is the ability to create vascular anatomies of individual patients. So they would take the CAT scan from a patient, right? and then print out the vasculature of that patient, and they could practice the procedure on these phantoms or models before going into the patient. And you know, by the time the patient is on the operating table, they would have figured out all the kinks of the procedure. Um, the other uh, focus of the center is to try to offer unique educational opportunities. Again, adding to what's currently offered at the university. We are planning to offer training um, skills, uh, training and skills in idea generation. Um, again, going back to how, how do you decide what to work on? How do you figure out what you want to make? And how do you prototype and test the feasibility of, of a concept and overall product development? Um, Going back to the previous slide, I just told you about the collaboration with Dr. Miner. So part of that collaboration also implies us, the biotech team, being able to participate in surgeries so we can be there and kind of identify new product innovation opportunities. What can we improve? Can we make a new stent? Can we make a new stent deployment device? And uh, we plan to expand our medical partnerships just to have more opportunities to innovate. Um, also, we are seeking to offer certificate programs in quality um, assurance and quality control uh, just to support our local biotech um, um, companies, project management, product development, and I put together a four-year undergraduate degree program in biotechnology that is currently under the evaluation of the administration. So fingers crossed, it's going to go through, and we'll see some new programs being offered by UM. Um, in this area of medical devices, as you could see hopefully from our own research, the projects are very interdisciplinary. So it's not enough to be an expert in physics or computer science. You kind of need to have that interdisciplinary aspect. So we are trying to build opportunities for our students to build up their interdisciplinary uh, uh, network and have access to that complementary expertise. As I told you, even starting with the shared lab space where you have people from different fields coming together. And last but not least, uh, we want to train our students in leadership and critical thinking just to make sure that they're properly positioned to be competitive on today's job market. Now, last but not least, because we are working on translational product projects, right? We want to make products that can make it to the market and make it to the people. We want to support um, entrepreneurialism, especially of our own faculty, the biotech faculty, and create spin-off companies. We, this is the first one that we have. It's called Mana Discoveries. And what these spin-offs do is help faculty take their idea from the academic lab into the commercial space and again, as I said, the idea is to not just have this great um, pro product that we publish about, but we actually want them to make it to the patients and to those um, that need them. And last but not least, I will end my talk, and I hope I'm not over time, um, with some of our outreach that we have done over the years. Obviously, COVID uh, messed up a lot of our plans. But every year, we used to have five to six uh, elementary student classes from Hellgate Elementary coming to our lab for one hour uh, hands-on experiments. And we would set up these experiments to be age appropriate. So you can see here, the first graders were just looking at some bubbly liquids and color changing solutions. Uh, we have older kids looking at states of matter and having a blast with um, dried ice, you know, how fascinating is that? Um, this is one of my students uh, demonstrating elephant toothpaste. I believe this was at uh, Rattlesnake. And uh, we also used to go to the classes in school and, and have 
a um, little science le um, lessons there. Um, we also interact a lot with high school students, and I had the privilege to work with Inspired Classrooms. Uh, Inspired Classrooms is um, focused on creating educational opportunities for remote areas and kind of expose students from remote areas to um, the latest technologies and, and new discoveries. And um, I don't remember when this was, probably five or six years ago, um, but when uh, we had this uh, live virtual presentation, we were interacting with nine high schools from all over Montana. So that, that was really exciting. Uh, we do have students from Hellgate High School working in our lab doing research. So we offer those opportunities. And through partnering with We Are Montana in the classroom, we actually had the opportunity to go to um, the Willard High School and talk about careers in science. And last but not least, we are trying to participate actively in all the university events that highlight um, STEM um, research happening here. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with Spectrum Discovery Area that does great things to expose our general community to science. So we partner with them um, whenever we can to share some of our work with the general community. And so uh, in summary, I hope I was able to give you a short snippet of what we do in our lab, what's our vision uh, for biotech, and what are our current initiatives. Um, I showed you some of our research. And hopefully now that we're back to normal, we'll be able to do outreach again. Um, none of the work that I presented would happen with, without the efforts of many. And I want to thank uh, current and past lab members that are especially major contributors to our research project. Um, we would not be where we are without our collaborators and partners. And last but definitely not least, uh, I um, am very grateful for the funding agencies who believe in us and choose to fund our research. And I would just like to leave you with uh, Benjamin Franklin's wor words that says that an investment in, co in uh, knowledge pays the best interest. And thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. That was fascinating. When I was a student at the University of Montana, <clears throat> that's what we called hard science, because it's hard. That's why my degree is in political science, which is not hard <laughs> as that. Um, so um, are there any questions? We'll have um, microphones that we can hand around. Susan has got a microphone. If you have a question, um, when you get the microphone, hold it like this so you can, not like this, like this. Like this? Like, this. <laughs> like that. Um, so that we can both capture for the audience your question and for the um, audience at home to be able to hear your question. And Ronnie is taking the um, questions from the people who are watching at home. So do you have some questions? I do. I have one from Mike Minnick. He'd like okay. to know how long the artificial skin grafts last before they're absorbed by the skin. Yes, yeah, so the question is how long the artificial skin grafts last before being absorbed in the skin. Uh, the, the results that I showed you are for 20 days and in an in vitro system. Um, I would think, based on my experience with silk, where I didn't tell you that, that the, the skin graft is made of silk fibrin, which is the same silk that you have in scarves, but we process it. Um, it can be degraded depending on how we process the material, anywhere between six months to two years. So that we can tailor. And the idea would be to have the device go away at the same rate that the tissue regenerates. So I hope I answered Mike's question. Thank you, Mike, for the question. Yeah. Really nice job, Monica. Thanks Thank you, for Roy. your good examples. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, your experience with the patenting system and, mm -hmm. and the licensing aspects of your work. Please. Right. So um, I, I do have to mention that um, I 
feel grateful to be supported by the university in terms of protecting intellectual property and working together on technology transfer. So uh, basically what happens when we think we have something that's patentable, obviously we do a patent search to figure out is there something um, similar that has been published already. If the answer is not, what we typically do is we file a provisional patent and that's happening with the help of the technology office from here, technology transfer office from here. Uh, that provisional patent basically is a placeholder for one year roughly for us to build more data to support our invention. But what that does for us too, it allows us now to publish, right? Because we want our students to have publications, but we don't want to give away our ideas without protection. So the idea is that we first file a provisional patent, then we are publishing, and then we generate enough data to do a patent conversion to a full patent. And um, we are working very closely with the technology transfer office to um, figure out strategies, especially in the context of what we're trying to do with biotech now, where we want to have this technology portfolio, as to what's the best strategy to now reach out to venture capital um, investors and other people who would be interested in investing and helping take these um, technologies out from the academia into the commercial space. Does that answer your question, Jess? Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions from the home audience? I'm kind of interested in the work that you're doing on um, drug delivery systems. I have a, one of my nephews um, is in that business. Mm -hmm. And when he talks about what he's doing, it fascinates me. But it seems to me there's a lot of opportunities for um, therapeutics and different ways of delivering um, drugs. Right. Uh, what, what do you think is the horizon for that? So, um, you know, it's interesting because people have been working on developing drugs forever, right? And still we find that, especially when it comes to targeted drug delivery, we're not where we should be. Um, I mean, I just look at the commercials every evening on TV and I see use that drug for this but then you have this whole list of side effects you know which seem way worse than actually the benefits of the drug so I think in my opinion uh, what should be the target and the focus is to try to figure out the best way to deliver a drug to where you want it to and kind of eliminate the the risks of this side effects so targeted drug delivery Again, uh, there's, there's a big effort towards trying to figure out topical delivery approaches for a lot of um, diseases, just because when you take things systemically, the drug goes everywhere. You cannot tell it, just, just go to the ear or something. Right? So. Um, another question I had is that um, I don't think that your work was um, on the campus, the work that you're doing was as important 40 years ago when I was here as it is now. What do you see as the growth for this? How many students do you think are gonna be involved in your program in five years? That's a tough question. <laughs> and I don't like to make predictions. I'm a scientist. I like to look at hard facts and make predictions based on that. And we're not there yet. But um, I, I think the, the way we approach things, and, and kind of to give you a little bit of a background, before I came to UM to work as a professor, I was in industry, in the biotech industry, and you saw the tissue engineering industry for almost six years. I know it's not a lot, but I learned a lot, or I would like to think so. And what I'm trying to do with the both the research and educational opportunities is to make sure that the students that we develop leave with skills that do make them competitive on the job market. I remember, so I, I did my PhD with a very entrepreneurial professor. He started, I believe, seven companies while I was doing my PhD. And so I thought that I know a lot about what it means to be in industry. And I remember going to my first job interview. The first question they asked me, um, did you work in a team? What do you know about teamwork? And I was thinking, I'm a PhD student. People wanted me to prove what I can do by myself. 
I was nice to my colleagues, but right. So there was no opportunity for me to le learn about teamwork. Then they were asking, well, do you know about GLP? And I was trying to figure out what is GLP? It's good laboratory practices, right? And yes, we did it, but I did not know that that's the terminology for it, and I did not know it to the extent that industry were, was looking for. So, you know, simple things like this kind of limit the options, the job options that you can have if you don't know the answer to some simple questions like this. And so that's kind of what we're trying to offer our students. And um, I think that's, that's pretty different. I, I was a lecturer at Tufts for a semester there. And even though they are very entrepreneurial, I still feel that they're lacking in offering some of these skills that industry and the job market is looking for. Paula would like to know how the noise protection molecules work. The noise protection, so I'm thinking this is the third project, engineering systems. So the idea is, and again, we're intellectual protection there. I don't want to, you know, give away information. But um, we found um, a way to make sure that the drugs are carried more efficiently into the cell space where damage occurs. And then in addition to that, we're trying to create special drug delivery devices that would increase even more so the amount of protective drugs that make it to the cells. Generally speaking, when you talk about hearing loss, no matter what's the cause, it happens because of oxidative stress. You heard it. I think even with the, what is that, the pomegranate juice that's antioxidant and all that. So and oxidative stress is bad, generally, OK? Um, that's one of the factors that also leads to hearing loss. And inflammation leads to hearing loss. So we're targeting uh, the development of compounds that would reduce oxidative stress and inflammation um, at the level of the sensory cells. Uh, your success, I Seems, would seem to depend a lot on getting the right materials to do mm -hmm. what you want to do. I'm not quite clear on whether you're modifying the materials, you're de developing the materials yourself, or taking materials off the shelf and finding uh, new applications for them. Um, it's a little bit of both. And what I mean by that is that we're using natural biomaterials for all our um, concepts in all our products. So for instance, the skin device, right, that is made of silk fibrin. Silk fibrin is a natural protein. Um, our bodies know how to deal with proteins, right? Our foods are protein. They know how to degrade it and deal with it. Um, another material we, worked, we work often with is called hyaluronic acid. And I'm pretty sure you've seen all those commercials for cosmetics with hyaluronic acid that helps. So that's another uh, natural material. So that's present in our eyeballs. That's what lubrifies our joints. Um, so again, we're always trying to use natural biomaterials that are not foreign to our bodies. So is it off the shelf? In a way, yes, because it's a material that has been characterized before. But what we do is we tailor those materials for our specific, specific need, either by, through the way we process them or we can chemically modify them to impart new function into them without still losing that natural biomaterial um, advantage. I've been sitting here trying to articulate the question that I want to ask you, so <laughs> bear with me. Do you have a uh, consolidated program by which you communicate your efforts to the government, to the um, affected um, industry, to the individuals, to the taxpayers? You know, do you have a consolidated communication program? Um, that's a very good question. And the answer is, 
yes and no, meaning there are ways where we publicize our science and achievements, but it could be significantly improved, right? So for instance, our scientific publications um, do um, you know, present our research and our results to the scientific community. But when you talk about scientific communications, it's usually scientists that read, read them, right? Um, every now and then we're fortunate, like in the case of our um, outer ear infection uh, project, where we are selected for a press release and that gets a wider audience. Uh, I believe the Reuters uh, news even made it in foreign countries like Turkey and all that. So it, it does get a broader audience, right? Uh, presenting to governmental agencies, we do go to conferences and we do present posters and talks. Obviously, you can imagine that every research group wants to present their science. So the competition is pretty high for having talks versus posters. If you have a poster, it's not as exciting as a talk, right? So we do have some ways to showcase what we're doing, but it could always be improved. And I think the university, I, at least personally, I feel that the university is really helping to promote my research. Um, and I'm hoping other colleagues feel that too. So yes, there's a cumulative effort to, to improve that, but it can always be better. What role does artificial intelligence play in what you're trying to do? So personally, none of our projects so far had to deal or incorporate elements of artificial intelligence. And now it all depends how do you define artificial intelligence. So for instance, I had a project idea that I submitted in a grant where I simply took silk fibrine and I engineered what I called logic gates on it. So similar to computational artificial intelligence concept where I could teach or train my silk material to do this when it senses this. So for instance, just to put it in very simple um, words here, um, I had a concept of adding a chemical molecule to silk that would change its color when it would detect the presence of bacteria, right? So for wound healing, if you would put it on a wound, if your dressing goes green, that means you have bacteria and you need to add antibiotics, right? So I'm oversimplifying here the concept, but you could incorporate some elements of artificial intelligence in what we're doing, but we were more focused on Again, when you think about reverse innovation and resource limited settings, I think trying to incorporate elements of artificial intelligence might not always be beneficial. So I hope that answers your question. Great, any other questions? Again, I think this has been fascinating tonight. Um, I hope that you have a greater appreciation for the amazing work that's going on on this campus. Um, and this, and last week just touched on it. We've got three more lectures uh, in the next three Tuesdays. Those of you at home, um, be sure to tune in. And if you feel like it, come join us here in person. It's always great. One of the great things I like about this lecture series is when it starts up, I see so many of the faces that I see year after year after year. And I know that this lecture series has value for for those of you who do attend. So um, thank you once again to Dr. Serben. Thank you for having and me. Thank I really you all for being it. here. Thank you.